Okay, so now we know what a heuristic function is. Um, now we can really get into heuristic search. So remember uh, the reason that uh, we were so disappointed with uninformed search like Dijkstra um, was that if we were trying to go from uh, uh, this green node here to this red node here, um, Dijkstra ended up expanding all these nodes going out. Um, Dijkstra is the same thing as uniform cost search. It keeps a, a, an open list sorted by the G value, the cost so far, and it always expands the node with the minimum cost so far. So that means um, when we generate nodes that are further out, they'll wait until all closer nodes are expanded. So um, it, just like the mathematical definition of a circle as all points within a particular radius, you'll see that Dijkstra or uniform cost search expands in radiating circles out from the start state. And as a result, by the time we actually get around to expanding the goal, we've visited everything that is um, within the optimal solution cost of the goal. Every node whose G value is less than F star, the, the optimal solution cost. And uh, that uh, doesn't seem very reasonable because um, for very intuitive reasons. Right? The nodes over in this part of the space are are the wrong way. <laughs> They're further away from the goal. And now that we have a, uh, the idea of a heuristic evaluation function that gives us an estimate of the cost to go to get to a goal, we can start to formalize this concept of why nodes over here are unreasonable. And it's exactly because um, We've spent some G value to get there, so they have a, a, a positive G cost, but their distance to goal is actually greater than, say, a node over here where we've also taken some G cost to get there, but now the distance to go is is smaller. So this node, a node over here, is closer to the goal than a node that's over here. So for the same G effort, we've actually moved closer to to the goal at least according to our heuristic function. Um, so that's why it's unreasonable to explore uh, nodes over on this side of the space is because we pay to get there and then we can easily see that, well, we're going to have to pay a lot to get to the goal. Whereas if we pay to get over here, we've decreased the cost to go. So the search algorithm ought to be considering both the cost that has paid so far, G, and the cost to go, which is F. And so that's exactly what A star search does. Um, it, it, uh, it considers the G value and the H value, and those are combined into this quantity F. F equals G plus H is the, the, the holy mantra of heuristic search. Now you can see why we use G <laughs> and F, because they line up to give us H. Don't blame me. Blame uh, the people who came up with A star, uh, who were quite brilliant, by the way. Uh, so. We have a star. This is a star search. It's the same pseudocode as before, except we're we're sorting the open list by f. So this is our our standard best first search. It keeps an a, a queue which represents the search frontier, or the formal name is the open list. Even though of course it's not a list, uh, you might want to implement it with a heap or something like that. Um, and we we always pop off the node with lowest f, and and look at it. Now, um, how does this actually work? Why would we expect this to expand fewer nodes than Dijkstra? We have this intuition about why it's important to consider H, but how does it actually work in practice? Um, well, let's take our, our little schematic scenario again. We're searching from this green node to the red node. Uh, the nodes expanded by A star end up looking kind of like this which is a huge win. We're not expanding everything that's um, within a uh, distance of F star from the start. Um, why are, is, is A star able to ignore nodes, say, up here and down here? Well, it's exactly because of the heuristic function. Remember that A star, like any best first search, stops when it expands the goal. So it has to expand all nodes whose value is less than the, the value of the goal. At the goal, the heuristic is zero. Right? There's zero cost to go because you're at the goal. So um, the F value of the goal is actually just equal to the G cost of the, the optimal path to get there. 
Uh, all the other nodes on open have G costs, but they also have H costs, right? So, um, so a node down here, for example, is going to have significant G cost and a significant H cost. It's going to have a very high F value. A star has to expand in order to, 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 to get around to expanding the goal. It has to expand all the nodes whose F value is less than the goal. And the F value, because it has this G component, is going to be greater than just the G value. So fewer nodes are going to have F values less than the optimal cost of the goal then would have G costs less than the optimal cost of the goal. H is, the, by adding in an H value, nodes like those over here uh, have their F value pushed higher than the optimal cost of the goal. So A star doesn't have to expand them. H is, is letting us exclude some nodes from consideration. It's, they Actually what happens is they go on the open list, but they're just ranked higher than the goal. So we never get around to having to expand them. So by considering by adding in H along with G, um, A star uh, expands many fewer nodes than Dijkstra, because nodes that uh, otherwise would have G values less than the optimal solution cost have F values that can be much higher. So they go to the end of the open list, and we don't have to expand them. So this is this is a sort of schematic of what uh, A, the nodes A star has to expand. This is a really simple example. Here's a concrete example in uh, Warcraft Pathfinding. If you have a little agent that's up here somewhere, I forget where the exact start state is. It's right about there. And is trying to get down here. So find the optimal path to, to get down there. This is a picture showing all the nodes that are expanded by uniform cost search, uh, otherwise known as Dijkstra. You can see it's basically the whole map. Um, the nodes are colored according to when they were expanded in the search. So these light yellow ones were expanded early in the search and then goes on and on and on. And then these red ones were expanded later. Uh, at the very end, we expand uh, nodes down here and we've reached the goal. So you can see it's visiting all nodes whose G value is less than the optimal solution cost. And we compare this with A star using a, a, a not very powerful heuristic. I've, I've forgotten uh, the exact heuristic that's used here. I think it's uh, Manhattan distance, the sum of the X and Y displacements. Um, and you can see that all these nodes out here that were expanded before, um, now they have uh, their F values are higher than the F of the goal, which is equal to the G of the goal. So all these nodes have F that's higher than the G of the goal, and they don't have to get expanded. One interesting thing you can see is that as the progress of the search, as denoted by the coloring here, uh, A star is expanding nodes with uh, lower F cost before nodes with higher F cost. Um, at the very end of the search, when we're expanding the goal down here, the, the F boundary actually includes all these nodes along here. And it's, it's interesting if you compare that with uniform cost search, you can see uniform cost search is sort of very steadily marching across the space. Um, uh, but uh, uh, A star uh, marches fairly directly to the goal. But as a consequence, in the late stages, it's actually going back and considering more nodes along here uh, because they weren't ex excluded at the beginning the way they were for uniform cost search. Anyway, so you can see that, that the heuristic is focusing the search and allowing us to, to um, not get around to expanding a lot of nodes. Um, we can find the goal much earlier. So A star is a much faster search algorithm than uniform cost search. Now, um, it's a little tricky to say very formal things about A star, uh, and we're not really going to cover in the class some of the sort of very fancy technical results that have been developed because um, they tend to make a lot of assumptions. Um, they're sort of complex. Um, is, but, but we can say certain things um, pretty straightforwardly. So is A star complete, for example? Is it, is it guaranteed to find a goal if one exists, um, find, a, find a path to a goal? Well, it doesn't do any pruning, does it? All it does is um, it, it, it always puts the children of an expanded node on the queue. So if there exists a path to the goal, um, some prefix of it is going to be on open at all times. 
and because uh, Acer never forgets anything or drops anything on the floor, prunes anything away, um, it, it is guaranteed to be complete. Um, so that's that's a nice characteristic. Now, how much time is it going to take to find a a goal? Well, that depends on how good your heuristic is, and characterizing how good a heuristic is is a sort of non-trivial thing. So. Uh, Let's just say uh, that in the worst case, you could be given the heuristic h equals zero. That's a valid underestimate. Um, and so then A star is going to be just like uniform cost search because it'll be ordering its Q on G. So the time in the worst case, we will have to expand the whole search tree um, in sort of uniform cost search order. Um, if you have a, a tree where every action costs one, this is going to be breadth first search. Um, so if you have a branching factor of B and a solution at depth of D, you're going to, uh, the tree is going to be B to the D. Uh, so A star is going to uh, take B to the D time to find that goal because it has to enumerate that whole tree down to depth of D. Uh, same thing with space because just like uh, with breadth first search, it's going to have to maintain that open list, that frontier. Um, and uh, so that's too bad. Admissibility, remember that this is, uh, are we guaranteed to find an optimal solution? Um, and the answer is yes. Let me let me sketch out the proof for you. Uh, let's see if I can if I can accomplish this. So, um, so we're trying to show that A star is going to return an optimal solution. Uh, let's see. Can I brighten the image a little bit? Let's see. There we go. Uh, so let's say we're going to let's do a proof by contradiction. Let's say that a, this is the open list of A star. You know the heuristic is uh, pushing things around a little bit. Let's say we we expand a node here, um, some solution um, here before we actually uh, get to the optimal solution. So the the optimal solution is here. Um, so let's say A star returns this rather than going returning that path. And let's say this path is cheaper. Optimal. This 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 opt, if you take the optimal path to this node opt, that's a cheaper plan, a cheaper cheaper path to a goal state than this path here. Um, so let's say A star were to make a mistake and return this node here. Um, uh, we're going to do a proof by contradiction and show that if that ever were to happen, the universe would explode. Uh, we, we would have a contradiction. So uh, in order to, to do this, this proof, I'm going to need to talk about this node here that's on the frontier. This is the node that A star should have expanded. Um, let's call it uh, P. Um, so P is on open and Sol is on open and somehow A star expanded Sol and terminated rather than expanding P and eventually getting towards opt. So P is the node on the, on the open list that lies on the optimal path towards opt. Now, um, we know a few things here. We know that um, the cost of the optimal solution here let me write it down here we know that the the cost of the optimal solution is uh, by the way we've set the thing up by definition less than the cost of Sol all right that's the setup we're assuming that a star expands this uh, and we're going to show that that causes a contradiction so opt was the, was the optimal solution, and sol is a worse solution, so it has a higher g value. Now, the g value of sol is equal to its f value, because it is a goal. right? Now, because sol was expanded uh, before p, and they're both on the open list, and a star expands the node with lowest f, we know that the f value of p has to be equal or greater to Sol. can't be lower, otherwise it would have been expanded first. Now, 
f of p is um, the g value to p and the h value going on, right? Um, f equals g plus h, the mantra of heuristic search. Now, p, by definition, lies along an optimal path. So, uh, so g of p is the optimal value. h of p is an underestimate, right? Or it's a non-overestimate. It's, it's an optimistic uh, estimate. It's a lower bound on the true cost. The true cost is going to be equal or greater. So that means that f of p has to be less than or equal to f of opt. And f of p is a lower bound on the true cost to get to opt. So now we have a contradiction because uh, opt is a solution, so its g value is equal to its f value. And equal, greater, greater, equal, greater. We just said that opt is less than itself. And so by assuming that A star expands sol before it expands opt, we derived a contradiction. So A star can't do that, um, and therefore it's admissible. So, so A star is an admissible algorithm. Um, now, um, here's something that's, that's often confusing to people. Um, not only is A star admissible in that it finds optimal solutions, it also happens that um, somebody, uh, namely actually Uta Pearl, who recently won the Turing Award, <laughs> the highest honor in computer science, um, Pearl and his student Rena Dechter were able to show that A star is optimally efficient. That is, among all admissible algorithms that find optimal solutions, um, no algorithm always does less work than A star. Um, so A star is an optimal admissible algorithm. Uh, so the uh, A star is is, an, is optimal. It's an optimal algorithm, uh, which means that it expands as few nodes as you possibly can while guaranteeing the solution is going to be admissible. Uh, so I apologize for the terminology, but um, that's what everyone says. So that's what we have to have to learn. Um, now I'm not going to do the formal proof of the optimality of A star because it's big and long and complicated, but I'm just going to give you some intuitions for it. Um, if H is admissible, um, the F values along any path are going to be non-decreasing, uh, it turns out. So uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, for a particular start node, if you go down any path from that node, the F values of the nodes along the path are just going to increase. Right, this f down here is going to be greater than that f, greater than, or e greater than equal to that f, greater than equal to that f, all the way down. Um, any path, f values will rise as you go down the tree. This is actually very intuitive because as you go down, the g values are are, are accurate, and uh, g uh, h the the uh, the heuristic was an underestimate, uh, so H is getting more and more accurate as you end up as you go down the tree. By the time you're finally at the goal, there is no H left, and you're just left with G, which is which is by definition perfect. So, um, so your your F, which is an underestimate of cost to the goal, by the time you get to the goal, it's the true cost. So instead of being an underestimate, it's accurate. So the value has has risen as you go down the tree. Um, so A star expands nodes in order of, of non-decreasing F, or, or you know, usually increasing F. Uh, and in order to prove you found the optimal solution, you have to look at all nodes that have F less than the optimal solution. Um, and A star uh, just cranks through them low, lowest to highest. So it looks at all the nodes it has to. And it doesn't look at any node that has an F higher than the optimal solution. So you can see how A star very efficiently looks at all the nodes it has to and doesn't look at any nodes it doesn't have to. So it would make sense that it's optimally efficient. 
Um, I glossed over a few details, but that's the, that's the basic idea of the optimality of A star. Now let's see if there's anything else that uh, we really want to talk about. Um, um, let's see. Well, one question is, uh, okay, now we've we've seen uh, A star, which is just a, a terrific algorithm. Um, we've seen greedy search, these these new more powerful ways of searching state spaces to find plans rely on heuristics. Um, where do we get these heuristic functions, these heuristic estimates, these lower bounds on cost? There are uh, there are a bunch of ways of deriving a heuristic. The, the main idea is something called relaxation. Um, so you find, well, you find a heuristic for a problem by relaxing the problem. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, uh, if you think about the sliding tile puzzle, for example, and I just happen to have one here. Um, here's a sliding tile puzzle. Uh, yeah, there we go. This one has the the blank in the goal for the goal state down here. If you think about the sliding tile puzzle, um, the we looked at two different heuristics. One was tiles out of place, and the other was Manhattan distance. Um, Manhattan distance gives you a, a larger value while still also being admissible, so it's the preferred heuristic. The Manhattan distance is. Uh, how far each tile has to travel to get to its goal destination. And the assumption there is that, well, that would be the true value if we could slide tiles over each other. We can't, so it's guaranteed to be uh, optimistic. It, it, it might paint too rosy a picture of how easy it is to get to the goal position. Um, now we removed a constraint from the problem there. One one constraint is that you can't run tiles over each other, right? They just they hit each other. So we've relaxed the problem by removing a constraint. We've we've loosened the problem up and said, oh, you don't don't worry about it. You can slide tiles over each other. Um, so the Manhattan the Manhattan distance heuristic is the optimal solution to a relaxed version of the sliding tile puzzle. So it's a solution to a relaxed problem. So one thing you can do if you're trying to find a heuristic for a problem is try and relax it. Try removing various constraints and see if that makes the problem easy to solve. Um, knowing the the optimal number of moves to solve a sliding tile puzzle is very hard. But it's not hard at all if you assume you can slide tiles over each other. I mean, Manhattan distance is really you know, polynomial time to compute, very, very, uh, very easy. So uh, usually relaxing a problem makes it more tractable. Um, in a complexity theoretic sense, oftentimes relaxing an NP-hard problem makes it polynomial. Um, so lots of good heuristics are, are polynomial time. Uh, in general, you want the heuristic to be cheap to compute because you're going to be computing a lot. In A-star, you compute it at every node. So you want it to be fast. And uh, in order for A-star to find optimal solutions, the heuristic has to be admissible. Uh, that was a key part of our proof for uh, the admissibility of A-star. Um, since it's going to be an underestimate, you always want it to be as, as high as possible while still being an underestimate, because then it's going to be most accurate. And it's, and if you think about that, uh, uh, that uh, picture here of the, all the nodes that A-star doesn't have to expand, the larger H is, the more nodes are going to get pushed beyond the optimal f value. And the smaller this gray area of nodes we actually have to expand is going to be. So you want a heuristic to be as high as possible. And um, there's a technical term, domination, that if, if some heuristic h2 is greater than or equal to some heuristic h1 for all nodes, for all possible nodes, h2 is always equal or greater, then h2 dominates h1, and it's going to produce faster search with a star. So uh, on the assignment, I think I ask you to derive a bunch of heuristics for the, the vacuum world problem. And um, you want to be thinking, OK, how can I make this value as big as possible? What are all the actions that I can guarantee you're going to have to take? Um, we don't 
we need to know their identity, but we need to know how many there are going to be. So you can estimate this this cost to a goal. Um, uh, how can I get a good uh, a good yet admissible uh, estimate of how many actions are remaining? So relaxing the problem is is key.